Welcome to From His Heart with Pastor Jeff Shreve, who's concluding his powerful series today entitled The Days of Noah, where we'll be reminded of the sin and evil in Noah's time and discover how close we are now to living in the days of Noah. Now, we have been in a series the last several weeks, the days of Noah, talking about that time period back, uh, way back when, probably some 5,000 or so years ago, when God had to de destroy the world with the flood. He said that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and every intention of the thought Thoughts of man's heart was only evil continually, and God was grieved in his heart. He was sorry that he made man. He was grieved in his heart, and he said, I will blot out man from the face of the earth, and he did that through a flood. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord, and God says, my spirit shall not strive with man forever, yet his days shall be 120 years, and God commissioned Noah to build a vessel, to build an ark, an ark of safety, an ark of salvation an ark that pictured the Lord Jesus Christ, a big, big vessel that would save the animals that had room for people to save people. And Noah preached for 120 years, and people didn't come. The only people that were saved in that antediluvian world were Noah, Mrs. Noah, Ham, Shem, Japheth, and their wives. That was it, eight people total. The world was terribly and horribly wicked. And it was a hard world to live in. And the reason that the days of Noah are important is not just because there was a movie in Hollywood uh, made about Noah that wasn't anything like the biblical account, but the days are important because Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. He also said, as it was in the days of Lot, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Days of Noah brought destruction. Days of Lot brought destruction destruction. We can learn a lot from the days and from the climate of the world at that time. Now, the question comes, okay, if, if what goes around comes around, and as it was in the days of Noah, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be, and we're in the days of Noah, as I believe that we are, and it's going to intensify the wickedness, how do you live in that environment? Uh, living in the days of Noah, how does a person do it? I mean, what do we do? You know, there are different schools of thought on what we're supposed to do as Christians, as believers. Oh, you live in a wicked world? What you need to do is pull out, and you just kind of cloister somewhere, and you build a monastery, and you get away from, from the rest of the world, and you go live in a cave somewhere, and, uh, you know, go watch Doomsday Preppers and get ready, you know, and you just do that kind of stuff. So there's, there's one school of thought. You just pull away. There's another school of thought that says, oh, well, you know, just live and let live. You know, I'm, not, I'm just going to live my life. And, you know, I mean, I live in a wicked world, and so, uh, you know, I'm not going to rock the boat. And then there's another school of thought that says, you know, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. And so, uh, not only do I live in this world, but I'm just going to just go along with whatever the world is doing and, and whatever the world says. That's, what, that's what's going to, uh, to drive me, and that's what's going to govern. So, different schools of thought that people have that claim to be Christians. Well, what does God say? How are His people to live in a world that is wicked and corrupt? 2 Peter chapter 3, I'll begin reading in verse 10. See, Peter had said that people mocked and scoffed about the second coming of Christ, and he says, hey, the reason why the Lord hasn't come is because the Lord is patient. He's not willing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burned up. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? 
looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God on account of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat. But according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless, and regard the patience of our Lord to be salvation, just as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, wrote to you, as also in all his letters, speaking in them of these things, in which the untaught, in which are some things hard to understand, which the untaught and unstable distort, as they do also the rest of the scriptures to their own destruction. You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, be on your guard, lest being carried away by the error of unprincipled men, you fall from your own steadfastness. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. The writings of Peter are finished. Two epistles, 1 Peter and 2 Peter, attributed to the apostle Peter. How are we to live? Well, he tells us. And I want you to notice with me five traits that ought to characterize every Christian in the last days, in these days of Noah that we are living through, in the days, I believe, that have been going on now for some time. First characteristic, first trait, God wants us to live in awareness. He wants us to live in awareness to know what's going on, to know what the Lord has said about these days. In the last days, he says in the early part of 2 Peter chapter 3, mockers will come with their mocking following after their own lust, making fun of the second coming of Christ. Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1, but realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. So the very first thing, that I want you to see that ought to characterize a a person who claims and who really does have a personal relationship with Jesus in these last days, in these days of Noah. Hey, you need to be aware because to be forewarned is to be forearmed. So the Lord says, hey, live in awareness. Second character trait. God wants us not only to live in awareness but to live in expectation. In expectation. Hey, the day of the Lord is coming. And God wants us to look for that and hasten that and and think about that and let that fill your mind. The Lord is coming. The Lord is coming. The Lord is coming. The Lord is coming, and his coming is near, as the Scripture says. Third characteristic. God wants us not only to live in awareness, not only to live in expectation, but to live in peace. Therefore, verse 14, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless. Found by him in peace. I love that. You know what the word for peace is in Greek? Irene. We get our name Irene from that. Quinn's wife is named Irene. That name means peace. That means harmony. It means tranquility within, exempt from rage and havoc. When you don't have peace inside, you're kind of like a raging storm. You're just uh, a tumultuous sea. But when you have peace, it's just calm inside. And here's the thing, and this is why this is so important. This is such a great encouragement. In the last days when all hell breaks loose and and wickedness is off the chain and there's vice and violence and apathy and apostasy and, and such hostility toward Christians, and you say, we have to live in that environment and I have to have my kids grow up in that environment and I have to have my grandkids grow up in that environment. I hear this so much from so many people. I'm so fearful and I'm so worried uh, about the world that my kids and grandkids and great-grandkids are going to have to grow up in. You don't need to be. You don't need to be because the Lord says, I want you to be at peace. When I come back, I want to find you at peace because I'm in charge and I'm in control. Jesus said in John 14, verse 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled nor let it be fearful. I don't care what happens in this world. Let not your heart be troubled nor let it be fearful. Are there difficult times? Yes. Do you have to be freaked out about it? Do you have to be biting your nails, pacing the floor? What am I going to do? How's this going to work? Oh, man, I'm in such trouble. No. 
We had prayer time last night. We have it every Saturday night. You're invited. 6.30, we meet over here, and we pray for 45 minutes or an hour, and we pray for the service, and we pray that God would just come down and do great things. And I was talking about peace, and Gloria Matthews, one of our uh, dear prayer warriors, she said, you know, when things happen to me, this is kind of a paraphrase because I didn't get it exactly right, but she said something to the effect, when things happen to me and I feel that I'm getting worried about something, I just stop right there and say, God, I belong to you. I'm your child. You said that I'd have peace, and so I'm just going to claim that, and I just let it go from there. I said, well, that's great. That's what we're supposed to do. Cast your burden on the Lord, and he will sustain you. See, there's two kinds of peace that the Bible talks about. There's peace with God that comes when you give your heart and life to Jesus. Therefore, Romans 5, 1, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That means there's no more war between you and God. You're not enemies anymore. You have given your heart to him. He's given his life to you, and there's peace with God. There's a peace treaty between you and God. That happens the moment you trust Christ. But then there's another kind of peace, which is the peace of God. The peace of God comes when you're walking with God, when you're right with God, when you're yielded to the Lord's Spirit. Scripture says, be anxious, worry about nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, shall guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. God wants us to live in peace. He wants to find us in peace. Number four, God wants us to live in wisdom and discernment. So we have, he says, hey, be aware. Be expecting me, which should change the way you live. Be in peace because I'm in charge and I'm coming and I have this all under control. And then I want you to be discerning. I want you to be wise. It says in verse 15, and regard the patience of our Lord to be salvation. Just as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, wrote to you. Now, why is God so slow by our definition in coming? Because he's patient, because he's waiting for more to come to him. And he says in verse 16, as also in all his letters, speaking in them of these things. Now watch it. In which are some things hard to understand. This is the apostle Peter saying, you know, when I read Paul, I scratch my head on some of the things that he writes. Because they're hard to understand. Have you ever done that in the Bible? You ever read through Romans 9, 10, and 11 especially? You're like, what in the world? Hey, Paul writes some things that are hard to understand. Peter had a tough time understanding it. I get a lot of encouragement from that because I say, yeah, I'm not really sure what it says, and neither did Peter. Uh, Paul's just tough. Paul was smart and uh, wrote some deep, deep things. Which are some, some things hard to understand, he said, which the untaught and unstable distort, as they do also the rest of the Scriptures to their own destruction. You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, be on your guard, lest being carried away by the error of unprincipled men, you fall from your own steadfastness. Now, you see where it says distort, which the untaught and unstable distort? That word distort means to twist. It means to pervert. It literally means to torture on the rack. You ever seen that medieval torture device, the rack where they would put those people and they'd put their arms up here and their legs and they'd turn that, that ratchet, that crank, and it would just pull them like this. Debbie and I years ago went to uh, London, to the Tower of London, and they took us down into the basement of uh, the big castle there and they showed us this is where they tortured people. They would put them on the rack. But to be put on the rack is brutal because it just rips your joints out and if they keep going, it'll rip your arms and legs off. It's awful. I mean, they stick you on the rack. It's like, hey, what do you want to know? I'll tell you now. You, you, say, you don't tell them what they want to you to tell them, and you're, you're not getting off of that thing in one piece. If they did, I mean, you just rip everything, rip all your tendons, rip everything out. And that's what he says these false teachers do with the Word of God. They put it on the rack, and they distort it, and they twist it, and they pull it apart, and they make the Bible say what the Bible doesn't say. He says, you watch out for that. You be wise and you be discerning. And don't believe everybody that comes along and says, though this is what the Bible says and this is what the Bible means. 
You'd be like the Berean Christians. When Paul came and preached there, uh, but they were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica. For they received the word with great eagerness, examining the Scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. Don't just take what I say. You go home and you check it out for yourself. And then you come back and say, hey, Jeff, you were right. I say, yeah, I was, I was right. I was. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to tell you things that aren't true. But false teachers will tell you things that aren't true. Now, in the days of Noah, one of the things that God said about the days of Noah, the earth was corrupt in the sight of God. Like rotten meat just had a stench to it. It was corrupt. You know, when meat goes bad, there's nothing you can do to meat to make it better, right? There's no amount of spice you can put on. Hey, just put on some barbecue sauce. It's rotten meat. When meat goes bad, you got to throw it out. And that's why God brought destruction, because the earth was corrupt. And there were uh, alliances, as we read about in Genesis chapter 6, between men and women and demons. And they were all mixed in together, and, and the devil was trying to pollute the human race. Now, corruption is coming to the church. Corruption in the form of vice, in the form of immorality, corruption in the form of the Bible doesn't say what the Bible says, and the Bible doesn't mean what we've always known the Bible to mean, namely in the area that we see in homosexuality, where people say today, well, I mean, it's, the Bible doesn't consent, condemn homosexuality. Yes, it does. The Bible says it's wrong. Bible says it's sin. Oh, no, that's not what the Bible says because I saw uh, a, a teaching from a really smart guy named Matthew Vines called God and the Gay Christian, and uh, as the quote from his book says, he dismantled every Bible-based argument against homosexuality. He says that the Bible doesn't condemn loving same-sex relationships. And he is optimistic that the position of acceptance of gay Christians is going to prevail. Well, I, I think the gay Christians probably will prevail in lots of churches because people will cave on the Word of God. Listen, the Bible is clear. Homosexuality is not the unpardonable sin, but it's a sin. It's a sin. And the moment that we say, well, we can have gay Christians and we can have uh, stealing Christians and we can have... Uh, adulterous Christians and lust-filled Christians and here are the pornography Christians and here are, are the bitter Christians. Listen, those are all sins. And so you can't put those together and say, well, it's okay to be like that. It's not okay to be like that. It's not okay to be bitter. It's not okay to be lust-filled. It's not okay to be jealous. Those are sins. Now, we deal with those, but the moment that you say it's okay, well, you've crossed a line. You've corrupted the Word of God. You've twisted it. You've put it on the rack. Be wise and be discerning. And we have to, in the church, make sure that we're on guard, that we watch everything that's coming down the pike that people are saying, and we test it by the Word of God. God says, hey, in the last days, uh, be wise and be discerning. And then lastly, God says to live in ongoing spiritual growth, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory. Grow. Hey, the Christian life is not a destination. It's a journey, and we're growing, and nobody has arrived yet. We just keep growing and growing in the Lord. We become more and more like Jesus. Some people stop growing. Some people have been a Christian a long time, and you stopped growing. Here's the thing about growth. Grow, when you grow as a Christian... You're going against the tide because the world's pushing you back this way. And so I have to keep moving forward to grow as a Christian against the tide of this world that wants to squeeze me into its mold. And if I rest on my laurels and I just say, you know, I'm tired of seeking the Lord. I'm just going to take a little break. And I'll just maintain my position here, my Christianity here. You won't do that because the world's coming against you. As soon as you quit swimming upstream, you start to go downstream. And so we have to constantly be seeking God. How are you going to grow in the Lord? You have to constantly seek Him in prayer and Bible study. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all of these things will be added to you. How are you going to grow in the Lord? You have to have an open heart that wants to learn, that wants to grow, that wants to do what God says do. The two words that every Christian needs to know and needs to say repeatedly. Yes, Lord. 
Yes, Lord. When you read the word of God and God, it leaps off the page and the Lord says, that's for you. Yes, Lord, I will do what you say to do. You come to church and the message is given and the plea is given. Come to Jesus. Get right with Jesus. Uh, Put the Lord first. Yes, Lord. Not, I'm going to dig my fingers into the pew and there's no way I'm coming down there and there's no way I'm going to do what God says. Listen, God can't use you if you're a no, sir kind of person. Because you can't say no, Lord. He's not Lord if you're saying no to him. It's either yes, Lord, or no, sir. So what are you going to be? Are you going to be a no, sir believer or are you going to be a yes, Lord? Yes, Lord. Lord, I have a lot of struggles. I have a lot of problems. I'm struggling with same-sex attraction, Lord. I'm struggling with pornography, Lord. I'm struggling with drugs and alcohol, Lord. But there's no way that I'm going to put those together and say I'm an addicted Christian. I'm a homosexual Christian. I'm a lust-filled Christian because those things are oxymorons. They don't fit. God, I'm coming to you with my sin. I'm asking you to help me because I want to be living in holy conduct and godliness. Hey, I'm going to grow in the Lord. i got to seek Him. i got to have an open heart to Him. And I have to be involved, actively involved in His church. I watch as a pastor when people start to flake off. First sign that they're going in the wrong direction. The first sign that they stopped growing and they're going to start going backwards is they quit coming. They quit coming. Boy, they used to come Sunday morning, Bible study and worship and Wednesday night, and they'd be there for the meal, and they'd be there for church, and they they would be involved in connection classes. They were coming all the time, and they were growing, and then they quit coming, and all of a sudden you get a phone call from them. Oh, we're getting divorced. Oh, uh, everything's falling apart. Yeah, no kidding. You need to keep seeking the Lord. You need to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Hey. I believe the Lord is coming soon. Do you believe that? I believe he's coming soon. He's right, as it says in the book of James, he's right at the door. And just as it was in the days of Noah when he built the vessel and the door in the middle of the vessel was open, it was open for years and years and years. And Noah preached his heart out. Come, God has salvation for you And there was apathy and apostasy, and they blew him off. And one day, the Bible says, God said to Noah, come into the ark. And Noah came into the ark, and God closed the door behind him. And the day of grace was over. I don't know when that day is, but I know it's coming. And I know that now we have an opportunity, regard the patience of our Lord to be salvation, now we have an opportunity to get right with him. And so I'm going to ask you to do that. So those in this room, you've never come to know Christ, you've never put your faith and trust in Christ, today is the day for you to say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me and save me. Those of you that don't have a church home, today is the day for you to say, this is going to be my church home because I want to grow in the Lord. Those of you who have been afraid to witness I'm going to ask you to make a decision today to say, I'm going to be the witness God wants me to be. Uh, Many of you need to come to the front and just pray and just say, God, here is my life. Take it anew and afresh. I want to be the Christian you want me to be, to live in the days of Noah, to to have holy conduct and godliness, and to be the witness you want me to be. My friend, the Lord loves you. Jesus died on the cross for your sins and rose again from the dead. And if you haven't put your faith and trust in Jesus, you can today. Just pray this simple prayer. Lord Jesus, I need you. I know that I'm a sinner and I'm lost and I can't save myself, but I believe you are God in the flesh who died on the cross for my sins and rose again from the dead. And right now, Jesus, I ask you to come into my life, forgive me of my sins, be my Lord and Savior. I surrender my all to you. My friend, if you'll pray that kind of prayer and mean it, the Lord will come in and your life will never be the same. Hey, I'd love to hear from you, to know that you're watching, to know that God is using this broadcast in your life, to know that you just prayed that prayer to receive Christ as Savior and Lord. Please take the time to call that toll-free number on the screen, write me, email me, let me know what's going on and how we can pray for you. You are important to God and you're important to us and we're here for you. Today's message, Living in the Days of Noah, is available in multiple formats. For information about how to get your copy, 
call 877-777-6171 or go online to fromhisheart.org. Hey, would you like to know about the future? Well, Jesus has told us that the future is going to be much like the past. In fact, he said, for the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. Noah's days, they were filled with wickedness and corruption, vice and violence. Hey, he lived in a world where people were on the precipice of judgment, and they didn't even realize it. And the same thing is happening today all around us. And the tragic part is that so many Christians have fallen asleep at the wheel. They're compromising with sin, they're basking in God's grace while ignoring God's truth. Now, certainly the Lord is rich in patience, but His patience is not without limits. And because God is a holy God, judgment is surely coming just as it came in Noah's day. Now in Genesis 6, 9, we read these words, Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his time. Noah walked with God. And God is calling you and me to come out from the darkness and walk in the light with Him. If you wanna do just that, I hope you'll get my seven message series titled, The Days of Noah, and my companion booklet, Strong Faith for Tough Times. They'll provide a word of warning and a word of encouragement for you and for our world. So request these two resources when you contact us today. God bless you. To say thank you for your gift of support this month to From His Heart, we'd like to send you Pastor Jeff Shreve's seven message series, The Days of Noah along with his encouraging booklet, Strong Faith for Tough Times, When the Impossible Meets God. Your gift of support makes such a difference. So thank you for standing with Pastor Jeff at this critical time in our history. Together, boldly sharing the truth of God's word to a lost and dying world. Thank you for watching From His Heart, the viewer supported broadcast outreach of Dr. Jeff Shreve, who believes that no matter how badly you may have messed up in life, God still loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Find out more at fromhisheart.org. Real truth, real